Așadar, Biden a ajuns astăzi în Israel. Potrivit mai multor surse, accentul în timpul vizitei a fost pus pe gestionarea unei situații complicate și mai puțin pe asigurarea unor rezultate clare. Biden s-a întâlnit cu premierul israelen Netanyahu într-o întâlnire bilaterală restrânsă foarte mică, întâlnire în care a reafirmat sprijinul Statelor Unite pentru războiul Israelului din Gaza. Această călătorie din Tel Aviv a lui Biden are loc, îți reamintesc, la o zi după ce oficialii palestinieni au declarat că un raid aerian israelian asupra unui spital din Gaza a ucis cel puțin 471 de persoane. Atac în urma căruia Iordania anulează summitul cu președinții Statelor Unite și Egiptului, un summit de pace. Liderul palestinian Mahmoud Abbas a retras anterior de la această întâlnire și între timp șeful ONU cere încetarea imediată a focului umanitar. Ultimele vești, cabinetul de uh, criză extins, sa, de urgență extins, s-a încheiat și îi acordă ministrului uh, apărării și uh, IDF, permisiunea de a ordona evacuarea orașelor din nordul țării atunci când va fi necesar. Despre ultimele întâmplări, despre ultima vizită a lui Biden, despre ultimele declarații ale lui Joe Biden, vorbesc chiar acum cu colega mea Sorina Matei, editor Alef News. Dar înainte de asta aș vrea să-l ascultăm pe Joe Biden, care dă chiar în aceste momente declarații după întâlnirea din Israel. Rape, beheadings, bodies burned alive. Hamas committed atrocities that recall the worst ravages of ISIS, unleashing pure, unadulterated evil upon the world. There's no rationalizing it, no excusing it, period. The brutality we saw would have cut deep anywhere in the world, but it cuts deeper here in Israel. October 7th, which was sacred to a sacred Jewish holiday, became the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. It has brought to the surface painful memories and scars left by millennia of anti-Semitism and the genocide of the Jewish people. The world watched then. It knew. And the world did nothing. We will not stand by and do nothing again. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. To those who are living in limbo, waiting desperately to learn the fate of a loved one, especially to families of the hostages, you're not alone. We're working with partners throughout the region, pursuing every avenue to bring home those who are being held captive by Hamas. I can't speak publicly about all the details, but let me assure you, for me, as the American president, There's no higher priority than the release and safe return of all these hostages. To those who are grieving, a child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling, a friend, I know you feel like there's that black hole in the middle of your chest. You feel like you're being sucked into it. The survivor's remorse, the anger, the questions of faith in your soul, starting at staring at that empty chair, sitting Shiva, the first Sabbath without them, They're the everyday things, the small things that you miss the most. The scent when you open the closet door. The morning coffee you shared together. The bend of his smile, the perfect picture of her laugh. The giggle of your little boy, the baby. For those who have lost loved ones, this is what I know. They'll never be truly gone. There's something that's never fully lost your love for them and their love for you. And I promise you, you'll be walking along some days and say, what would she or he want me to do? You smile when you pass a place that reminds you of them. That's when you know. When a smile comes to your lips before a tear to your eye, that's when you know you're going to fully make it. That's what will give you the fortitude to find light in the darkest hours. When terrorists believe they could bring down bring you down, bend your will, break your resolve. But they never did and they never will. Instead, we saw incredible stories of heroism and courage. Israelis taking care of one another. Neighbors forming watch groups to protect their kibbutz. Opening their homes to shelter survivors. Retired soldiers running into danger once again. Civilian medics flying across rescue, flying rescue missions and off-duty medics at the music festival caring for the wounded before becoming a victim, before becoming a victim himself. 
volunteers retrieving bodies of the dead so families could bury their loved ones in accordance with Jewish tradition. Reservists leaving behind their families, their honeymoons, their studies abroad without hesitation, and so much more. The State of Israel was born to be a safe place for the Jewish people of the world. That's why I was born. Long said, if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. And while it may not feel that way today, Israel must again be a safe place for the Jewish people. And I promise you, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that it will be. Seventy-five years ago, <clears throat> just 11 minutes after its founding, President Harry S. Truman and the United States of America became the first nation to recognize Israel. We've stood by your side ever since. We're going to stand by your side now. My administration was in close touch with your leadership from the first moments of this attack. We're going to make sure we have what you have what you need to protect your people, to defend your nation. For decades, we've ensured Israel's qualitative military edge. And later this week, I'm going to ask the United States Congress for an unprecedented support package for Israel's defense. We're going to keep Iron Dome fully supplied so we can continue standing sentinel over Israeli skies, saving Israeli lives. We've moved U.S. military assets to the region, including positioning the USS Ford Carrier Strike Group in the Eastern Mediterranean, with the USS Eisenhower on the way to deter, to defer further aggression against Israel, and to prevent this conflict from spreading. The world will know that Israel is, str Israel is stronger than ever. And my message to any state or any other hostile actor thinking about attacking Israel remains the same as it was a week ago. Don't. 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 Since this terrorist attack, terrorist attack took place, we've seen it described as Israel's 9-11. But for a nation the size of Israel, it was like 15 9-11s. The scale may be different, but I'm sure those horrors have tapped into so, some kind of primal feeling in Israel, just like it did and felt in the United States. Shock. Pain. Rage, an all-consuming rage, I understand and many Americans understand. You can't look at what has happened here to your mothers, your fathers, your grandparents, sons, daughters, children, even babies, and not scream out for justice. Justice must be done. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. I'm the first U.S. president to visit Israel in time of war. I've made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. There's always cost, but it requires being deliberate. It requires asking very hard questions. It requires clarity about the objectives and an honest assessment about whether the path you're on will achieve those objectives. <clears throat> the vast majority of Palestinians are not Hamas. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Hamas uses innocents, innocent families in Gaza as human shields, putting their command centers, their weapons, their communications tunnels in residential areas. Palestinian people are suffering greatly as well. We mourn the loss of innocent Palestinian lives like the entire world. I was outraged and saddened by the enormous loss of life yesterday in the hospital in Gaza. Based on the information we've seen to date, it appears the result of an errant rocket fired by a terrorist group in Gaza. The United States unequivocally stands for the protection of civilian life during conflict, and I grieve, I truly grieve for the families were killed or wounded by this tragedy. The <clears throat> people of Gaza need food, water, medicine, shelter. Today, I asked the Israeli cabinet, who I met with for some time this morning, to agree to the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza, based on the understanding that there will be inspections and that the aid should go to civilians, not to Hamas. Israel agreed the humanitarian assistance 
can begin to move from Egypt to Gaza. Let me be clear. <clears throat> if Hamas diverts or steals the assistance, they will have demonstrated once again that they have no concern for the welfare of the Palestinian people. And it will end. <clears throat> As a practical matter, it will, it will stop the international community from being able to provide this aid. <clears throat> We're working in close cooperation with the government of Egypt, the United Nations, and its agencies like the World Program and other partners in the region to get trucks moving across the border as soon as possible. Separately, I ask Israel that the global community demand that the International Red Cross be able to visit hostages. I just demanded that the United States fully — a just demand that the United States fully supports. Today, I'm also announcing $100 million in new U.S. funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. This money will support more than 1 million displaced and conflict-affected Palestinians, including emergency needs in Gaza. You are a Jewish state. You are a Jewish state, but you're also a democracy. And like the United States, you don't live by the rules of terrorists. You live by the rule of law. And when conflicts flare, you live by the law of wars. What sets us apart from the terrorists is we believe in the fundamental dignity of every human life. Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, Jew, Muslim, Christian, everyone. You can't give up what makes you who you are. If you give that up, then the terrorists win and we can never let them win. You know, Israel's a miracle, a triumph of faith and resolve and resilience over impossible pain and loss. Think about October 7th, the Jewish holiday, where you read about the death of Moses, <clears throat> a tragic story of a profound loss to an entire nation, a death that could have left a helpless hopelessness in the hearts of the entire, of an entire nation. But though Moses died, his memory, his message, his lessons have lived on for generations of the Jewish people as well as many others, <clears throat> just as the memory of your loved ones will live on as well. After reading the story of Moses' death, those who observed the holiday began reading the Torah from the very beginning. The story of creation reminds us of two things. First, that when we get knocked down, we get back up again and we begin anew. And second, when we're faced with tragedy and loss, we must go back to the beginning and remember who we are. We are all human beings, created in the image of God with dignity, humanity, and purpose. In the darkness, to be the light unto the world is what we're about. You inspire hope and light for so many around the world. That's what the terrorists seek to destroy. That's what they seek to destroy, but because they live in darkness, but not you, not Israel. Nations of conscience, like the United States and Israel, are not measured solely by the example or power. <clears throat> We're measured by the power of our example. <clears throat> That's why, as hard as it is, we must keep pursuing peace. We must keep pursuing a path so that Israel and the Palestinian people can both live safely in security, in dignity, and in peace. For me, that means a two-state solution. We must keep working for Israel's greater integration with its neighbors. These attacks have only strengthened my commitment and determination and my will to get that done. I'm here to tell you the terrorists will not win. Freedom will win. So let me end where I began. <clears throat> Israel, you're not alone. The United States stands with you. I told the story before, and I'll tell it again, of my first meeting with an Israeli prime minister 50 years ago as a young senator. I was sitting across from Golda Meir at her desk in her office, and she had a guy named, a guy who later became prime minister, sitting next to me, just before the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And she flipped the maps up and down, t telling me how bad things were and how terrible they were. All of a sudden, she looked at me, and she said, would you like a photograph? I looked at her. She got up from her desk and walked out into that hallway. I think it's marble flooring. Walked out in the hallway. We walked out, and there were a bunch of photographers standing in front of us. 
We're standing shoulder to shoulder. Without her looking at me, she said to me, knowing I'd hear her, why do you look so worried, Senator Biden? And I said, worried? Like, of course I'm worried. And she looked at me and she didn't look. She said, we don't worry, Senator. We Israelis have a secret weapon. We have nowhere else to go. Well, today, <clears throat> I say to all of Israel, the United States isn't going anywhere either. We're going to stand with you. We'll walk beside you in those dark days. And we'll walk beside you in the good days to come. And <clears throat> they will come. As you say in Hebrew, which I'm not going to attempt to do because I'm such a terrible linguist, I'll say it in English. The people of Israel live. The people of Israel live. <laughs> Israel will be safe, secure, Jewish, and democratic state today, tomorrow, and forever. May God protect all those who work for peace. God save those who are still in harm's way. Thank you very much. Așadar, am ascultat un discurs destul de îndelungat al președintelui american Joe Biden după vizita în Israel și după ce s-a încheiat și cabinetul extins. Joe Biden, foarte pe scurt, vă spun, a reasigurat Israelul de sprijinul necondiționat al Statelor Unite. Spune că, așa cum și-a încheiat discursul, poporul israelian trăiește și va trăi, iar SUA va fi aici pentru a se asigura de asta. Practic, vorbește Biden și de spre faptul că Palestina și poporul palestinian, de fapt, nu înseamnă gruparea Hamas și delimitează foarte clar uh, aceste uh, lucruri. Hamas folosește oamenii ca scuturi umane uh, și spune Biden că a obținut de la Israel o asigurare cum că va trimite ajutor umanitar pentru uh, civilii care se află în aceste momente în pâșia Gaza și se va asigura că uh, acel ajutor nu va fi furat sau pus deoparte de gruparea Hamas. Uh, la fel cere Hamas să lase se crucea roșie să viziteze ostaticii pe care îi au în interiorul fâșiei Gaza și mai departe aș vrea să discutăm despre toate întâlnirile de astăzi destul de importante pe care le-a avut Biden cu colega mea, Sorina Matei, editor al F-News. Sorina, așadar, care sunt concluziile după această zi destul de lungă? Păi nu cred că putem trage concluziile că evenimentele nu s-au sfârșit. Avem doar prima parte de deci, tabăra israeliano americană avem această concluzie a vizitei până la ora 5, vedem că asta până la ora 5, președintele Joe Biden, care în acest moment, prin discursul său, a garantat securitatea statului israelian. A spus că va exista ajutor militar dat prin congres de către statul american, un ajutor militar care nu a mai existat până acum în istorie oferit de Statele Unite. Important este că uh, Raluca a atins subiectul Gaza pentru că, să nu uităm aici, avem două lumi. Uh, a spus că a decis cu Israelul acordarea de ajutor umanitar, dar informațiile aici vin, uh, una spune uh, președintele Biden, una spun membrii cabinetului israelian. În continuare este această reticență a cabinetului israelian de a trimite ajutor umanitar în Gaza pentru că israelienii vor să intre cu trupe în Gaza. În paralel, Statele Unite vor trimite ei 100 de milioane pentru Gaza în afara ajutorului umanitar care este trimis prin Egipt, cere Crucea Roșiei să poată vizita răpiții pentru că Joe Biden s-a întâlnit cu familiile brăpiților în Tel Aviv a vorbit de soluția celor două state dar se aștepta pentru că au existat și aceste interpretări din par ca să tempereze lucrurile ca Joe Biden să ceară practic lumii întregi să ajungă la o soluție pentru Palestina ceea ce nu s-a întâmplat deci asta avem din partea Israelului se așteaptă plecarea lui Biden ca să, de pe teritoriul uh, israelian, astfel încât uh, să vedem dacă se va adopta o decizie a unului privind uh, încetarea focului în această seară, pentru că se va reuni, reuni uh, 
Organizația Națiunilor Unite și ce vor face ambele tabere după ce va pleca președintele Statelor Unite, pentru că până acum, ai văzut, nu au fost atât de multe bombardamente, cumva ambele părți au respectat faptul că președintele Statelor Unite se află pe o zonă de conflict militar. De cealaltă parte, avem Organizația pentru Cooperare Islamică condusă de Iran, care a cerut și ea redeschiderea punctelor de trecere a frontierelor a frontierei în Gaza, dar în același timp tonul aici îl dă Iranul. Iranul cere în continuare, au fost mai multe declarații făcute de ministrul de externe, cere oprirea livrărilor de petrol, practic un embargo pe petrol pentru Israel, cere în continuare ca toate statele arabe să expulzeze ambasadorii izraelieni și în același timp avem aceste mitinguri în lumea arabă care au degenerat în Liban și în Iordania să lupte de stradă, practic, iar vizate sunt ambasadele americane și izraeliene. Se mai așteaptă în această seară un moment important va fi discursul lui Mahmoud Abbas, președintele autorității palestiniene, care vom vedea dacă va tempera cumva prin discurs lumea arabă, lumea palestiniană, pentru că și aici este o discuție. Palestinienii sunt foarte curioși pe Mahmoud Abbas și practic că îl fac trădător și cer să nu mai discute în acest moment cu niciun lider occidental. Deci cam asta este situația. A existat și președintele Raisi, președintele Iranului, care a vorbit din Teheran un discurs foarte foarte puternic anti-american și anti-israelian, dar cumva uh, Iranul spune prin președintele său că dacă se va degenera situația, adică se va escalada, uh, va fi decizia Hamasului și nu va fi decizia Iranului. Vedem că și președintele Joe Biden are aceeași uh, sperietură faptul că această, acest conflict militar va degenera, având în vedere situația din Liban, deciziile Hezbollah de aseară de a uh, se ieși în, în stradă și ceea ce se întâmplă uh, în Beirut, deschiderea frontului de nord, lucru pe care l-a avertizat uh, în urmă cu câteva minute și președintele Joe Biden. Să nu fac asta pentru că în cazul în care va interveni Libanul, Hezbollahul, uh, portavioanele americane vor interveni în conflict. Da, Sorina, îți mulțumesc tare mult pentru analiză.